Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this ICAST webinar, Tax Issues Regarding Pensions. For those that don't know me, my name is David Mingus and I'm Director of Practice here at ICAST and it's my great pleasure to be your webinar host today. So with an increasing state pension age, it's likely that individuals will need to rely more and more on their additional pension arrangements to fund their retirement. Some may have a personal pension scheme that they want to contribute to, while others will have an arrangement through their employer, whether that be under pensions, auto enrolment, or a more generous arrangement. Either way, the tax rules on pension contributions have changed in recent years, and this webinar is intended to bring you up to date or act as, an, uh, as a refresher on those changes. In addition, some of you will have clients who work for the public sector, where a final salary or a career average scheme will be in operation. Well, a legal case into the 2015 changes to pension schemes found that the changes discriminated against younger workers, and this brought about what is known as the McLeod remedy. And this may have a bearing on the tax position of clients affected. And while we're unable to give financial advice, the web this webinar should make you aware of some of the issues that you need to be aware of when giving tax advice to your clients. So over the next 50 minutes or so, we'll have a look at uh, providing an understanding of the key technical aspects around personal and employer pension contributions, understand a bit more about the deductibility of employer contributions and about the spreading of relief in certain circumstances, as well as delving into those recent developments in public pe sector pension schemes in a little more detail. And to help explain uh, some of those issues, I'm delighted to be joined today by Chris Campbell, and James Edwards. Chris is our Head of Tax on Tax Practice and OMB Taxes here at ICAS and is a Chartered Accountant and Chartered Tax Advisor. Chris joined ICAS after a career in practice supporting owner-managed businesses and he supports members with technical queries and represents ICAS on various HMRC stakeholder groups. James is a tax director at Anderson and Edwards, a practice based in Edinburgh. James is also a chartered tax advisor specialising in the taxation of individuals, as well as the taxation of trusts, estates and inheritance tax. This allows him to deal with a range of issues from employees with income tax issues to farmers with capital gains tax and succession issues. James also uh, is involved in the Scottish Tax Clinic, a pro bono service provided in conjunction with the University of Edinburgh, providing advice and assistance on tax issues to low income and vulnerable persons. So before we begin, uh, just a few housekeeping matters to remind you of. Uh, you will be able to submit questions at any time through the Q&A facility, which can be accessed at the top of your screen. Questions can be submitted anonymously. Um, and we'll have a Q&A section at, uh, towards the end of the webinar, so we'll save all your questions to then, but please do uh, put your questions in at any time as we go through. You can also join the conversation today through the chat box accessed at the top of your screen, and this allows you to comment or discuss with fellow attendees on the matters covered by this webinar. We will, of course, uh, be recording this webinar and we'll be making it available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or share it with others. And of course, the all-important question, yes, the slides will be available uh, later on. These will be available on the events page on the ICAS website under the event listing. So we do, of course, look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinar and we'll try to get as many of those as possible. So I know uh, both Chris and James have an awful lot to, to get through. So without uh, any further delay, I'll pass straight across to Chris. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, David, and good afternoon to everyone. It's um, great to be with you all this afternoon. If you're wondering if I sound a little bit different from the webinar I was presenting a couple of weeks ago, um, I have not been uh, on a 60 day cigarette habit. I'm afraid that I am suffering from a little bit of a cold at the moment, so my voice is a few decibels lower than it might normally be. If anyone has um, any suggested remedies that might help me, do feel free to pop them in the chat. If there's not any tax things that you want to raise, um, hopefully you'll have some questions or points you might, to be, might want to make on, on pensions. So you, you don't need to adjust your, uh, your login. Your sound is perfectly fine. I'm just sounding a little bit deeper than I might normally do. Anyway, back to uh, back to business this afternoon. So we're going to start with a, a little bit of an overview on the tax relief on personal pension contributions. 
think about the annual allowance on tax relief for pension contributions and how that interacts with both personal contributions and employer contributions. Before having a look more generally at employer contributions, some of the special spreading rules for businesses that are making larger contributions on behalf of their employees. Before handing over to Jamie, it's great to have Jamie with us this afternoon. He's got a lot of practical experience on the McLeod remedy, which is going to be cropping up and might be affecting some of your clients in the coming weeks and months. And then, as David said, we'll wrap up with a, a Q&A at the end. So, starting with tax relief on personal pension contributions. Now, for most individuals, um, they'll be dealing with a defined contribution scheme. So the pension pot will be based on the contributions made, the investment performance of the fund, no link to the final scale salary. I know that the uh, public sector schemes will be different to that, and, and Jamie will explain a little bit more about that uh, later on. So to obtain tax relief on personal personal contributions, it's necessary for the contributions to be made by qualified person, which is a UK resident with relevant earnings and need to be aged under 75. Now, for those of you who like to look at the legislation behind all this, the Finance Act 2004 is your go-to place, and specifically Section 190 for the maximum annual contribution, which is the higher of £3,600 gross or £2,800 net, and 100% of net relevant earnings. Now, this 3600 figure does give the opportunity, most people will have earnings higher than that, but there might be some people that some tax planning, uh, say for example, if you're looking to put a pension scheme in place with a, for children who have got no income, that's sometimes seen as an attractive uh, longer term thing to do from inheritance tax planning because it's not within the scope of um, inheritance tax, um, but also gives um, a pot, a pension pot going, but in most cases it will be individuals paying into their own personal pension scheme. So by net relevant earnings, section 189 in the Finance Act 2004 gives more details of this. You're looking at things like employment income, benefits in kind, trading income. I've included furnished holiday lettings in there. Now that has been the case um, for a number of years, but those of you who are up to speed with the latest announcements in the spring budget will know that the current expectation is that FHL treatment will be withdrawn in April 2025. Now, we do have a general election campaign ongoing. We don't know whether that will continue to go ahead as planned. There's not even been any legislation announced by the current government on this, so um, it's very much a case of watching the space. But if furnished holiday lettings cease to have their trading Status that that would have an impact on the ability to make personal pension contributions based on that earnings. So when you're looking at a client who's got personal pension contributions, you need to be clear about what scheme that the client has got. So is it a relief at score scheme? So have they paid net or basic rate income tax uh, the pension? So a simple illustration being that £80 is taken off from their net pay, but £100 goes into their pension pot and the 20% UK income tax difference is, uh, is paid over to the pension provider on their behalf. They will be older pension arrangements of the retirement annuity contracts. They went, I think you can only open them the 1980s, so they're, they're fewer and far between as um, as we go. So you'd have to be someone who was very, very young when they opened their retirement annuity to be able to still have one of them. That's deducted from gross pay. There'll be other pension schemes where, such as occupational pension schemes, where they, there's a net pay arrangement, so they get all the tax relief at source. So when you're thinking about, do you um, does your client need to claim any additional tax relief on their tax return? you need to be really, really clear about what scheme it is, because if it's a retirement annuity or a net pay arrangement, then they've had all the tax relief already at whatever their, their marginal rate is at source um, without further any claims being needed. If you've got someone who's in a salary sacrifice arrangement, then their personal pension contribution will be zero. They often think of it as their personal pension contribution, but they're actually accepting a lower salary from their employer 
on the basis that their employer is paying a higher employer pension contribution on their behalf. So there's a lot of misunderstandings out there and it's important that uh, from the point of view of those advising clients in practice that you make sure that you claim any additional rate uh, at higher rates. So it could be um, any of the, uh, the Scottish rates above 20% for a Scottish taxpayer or somewhere in the rest of the UK, it could be higher rate or the additional rate relief. Because the thresholds for those further tax bans above the 20% rate are increased by the gross contributions. So you make sure you claim them for those um, of which relief has not already been claimed, but don't claim them on retirement annuity contracts, net pay arrangements, occupational schemes or salary sacrifice because they will already have all the pension relief um, due to them um, already. So what's great about pension? Why is it an attractive thing uh, for an individual to have? The tax position, it's pensions have often always had for quite some time quite an attractive tax regime because the pension goes itself tax free during an individual's working life. If they don't reach retirement, the pension pot is quite um, attractive from a tax point of view in that it passes uh, free of inheritance tax generally. And if the taxpayer wants, an individual wants to access their pension, they can do that from age 55. Now that's going up to age 57 from 2028. And at that point, they've got the option to access their tax free lump sum 25% with any further withdrawals being taxed. There's also the opportunity to use pension as a way of tax planning for those individuals who might lose their personal allowance. So once the personal allowance starts getting withdrawn at £100,000, there's the opportunity, you can't backdate to earlier tax years. So if you realise in the tax year that one of your clients is going to have uh, the loss of the personal allowance, one option to deal with that could be having them pay a higher pension contribution to get their their income for the personal allowance purposes, adjusted net income down to uh, the hundred thousand pounds. Now, all these things is great from the point of view of tax, but it's important to make sure that tax is not the only factor in these circumstances, because they are able. To, it's important for clients to be able to get the appropriate financial advice from an independent financial advisor. We can't as accountants give that advice, it, it's going into um, areas of specialism that's beyond just the tax. So it's important that the, the financial advisor is able to give them the right decisions for their circumstances, which may or may not take account of the tax relief or what's best from a tax point of view. We've talked a bit about the tax reliefs that individuals can receive when they pay into their pension scheme. But it is important to bear in mind that whilst there is um, tax relief available, it can be restricted in some cases, depending on the level of contribution that's been made and also the income of the taxpayer. Now, these thresholds have changed a little bit in recent years. And we used to also have the lifetime allowance, which had an additional complication with that. changed in April 2024. So the lifetime allowance is no longer part of the equation, but we still have the annual allowance. And this is currently £60,000. It was £40,000 for a number of years up to the 2022-23 tax year. And it's quite easy for defining contributions to determine what the annual allowance is because it's paid uh, payments into the, the pension fund, but it gets more complicated with the final salary schemes that Jamie is going to be talking about later on because they look at the increase in the value of the scheme during the year and how you rely on the bit of paper from the, the pensions um, office to tell you what figures you need to consider whether you've got an annual allowance issue for your client when preparing their tax return. In some cases, taxpayers will not only have an annual allowance charge based on their own contributions, they might also have an annual allowance issue based on the contributions that is made by an employer uh, or any third party that might be making uh, great, I suppose, for an individual to have a high level of contribution being paid by an employer or third party, less attractive if they've got a personal tax to pay on their tax return in the form of an annual allowance charge. 
because that tax is payable at their marginal rate. So whatever the top rate of tax they're paying, that's the rate that you're looking at paying the, the, the charge for the, the annual allowance, if, if there is one. Now, it's, it could be more than 60,000 or less in, in that year, because you can also use unused annual allowance from the previous three tax years. Uh, so that might mean you have more allowance to play with in a particular tax year. But also you've got um, individuals with higher incomes having a tapered annual allowance. Once their income is at those higher levels, it might not even be as high as 60,000. So a lot of factors at play. You need to look at each year individually as well to see well, what was the annual allowance this year? What's the annual allowance in the previous three years? What's been used already? Um, and it will vary. It's not a, it's not a simple exercise. Uh, by any stretch, it will vary depending on what the, the taxpayer's income was in each of the respective years. So if the current rules, there's, there's two thresholds that you need to be thinking about. There's the adjusted income threshold, so it's adjusted income level and the threshold income. These are two similar but slightly different terms and depending on what the clients particular circumstances are will affect whether or not there's a, any adjustment to the £60,000 annual uh, allowance. So the first thing you need to look at is whether the, I've got definitions on uh, the next slides of what each of these terms mean, but you only have a tapering of annual allowance once the taxpayer's got adjusted income above £260,000, but that only applies if the threshold income exceeds 2,000, 200,000, pardon my uh, slip of the tongue there. And why should, if that was the case, you're looking at the annual allowance reducing by one pound for every two pound of adjusted income above the 260,000 pounds. It's worth bearing in mind that the adjusted income threshold was 240,000 pounds for the 2020, 21 to 22, 23 tax years. So you need to take account of the applicable allowance thresholds in the brought forward. So what would each year have been the last this year, previous three years, what's the income? Would we have an annual allowance restriction? Yes or no. If we do, what's the annual allowance? What's already been used? And then you can then see how much maximum contribution could be made before you've got an annual allowance issue in the year in question. So when it looks at the threshold income for a start, the starting point is the net taxable income for the year. You then deduct gross pension contributions for relief as its source, but not employer contributions. Deduct any lump sum death benefits received from registered pension schemes. I've not seen any of them when I was working in practice. And added in any reduction in income from salary sacrifice arrangements for pension after 8th of July 2015 and add any reduction of employment income for pension provision through any relevant flexible remuneration arrangements made after 8th of July 2015. Now I have got a numerical example that hopefully make the, these terms seem a little bit more straightforward um, to understand. And a lot of the, the points in the criteria don't necessarily apply in most cases. So this is what HMRC says on their website, the definition of these terms. So if you look at the adjusted income, your starting point is the net income for the year. You're adding the amount of any claims for tax relief and pension savings paid uh, before tax relief given, such as if someone else is paid into the pension. You're adding in any pension savings made to the scheme where tax relief is given because the employer deducted, pay for, uh, deducted the contribution from pay before income tax. For any non-domicile taxpayers, add any relief claimed on pension schemes uh, made to overseas schemes. Um, but the most relevant one is you're adding in the employer pension savings here. So you could have a situation where someone's above the 260,000 adjusted income because their employers made a significant pen uh, pension contribution, but that would only be an issue if, that they're, if, if they have both thresholds met. So it's got to be they, if you go back um, a couple of slides here, it's got to have the adjusted income above 260,000 and the threshold income above 200,000. So if, if they don't have a significant 
salary, for example, but aren't being given a large employer pension contribution, they might find that even although their adjusted income is above £260,000, their threshold income might still be below the £200,000, in which case the restriction on the annual allowance doesn't apply. We've got a little bit of an example here, using the example of John, is a salary of £235,000, a bonus of £15,000, and interest of div and dividends of £15,000. He pays a gross pension contribution of £25,000, and his employer paid an employer contribution of £35,000. So in this example, you can at the threshold income being the 235 salary, plus the bonus of 15, plus the interest and dividends of 15, you're then deducting the gross pension contribution, that's £240,000. Now that's above the £200,000 uh, threshold. Now looking at the adjusted income, you've got the 235,000, add the 15 and the 15 again, and but this time you're looking at the employer contribution being added in. So that add the 35,000, that gives you 300,000 pounds. So in this example, John's annual allowance is reduced by half of the excess of the, uh, above the 260,000 pounds. So it's reduced by 20,000 pounds, so it goes from 60,000 pounds to 40,000 pounds. Now, it's possible that John, if he had brought forward allowance, he'd actually have paid with a bit of planning. You can't back that date these things um, have to happen with, with a bit of planning in advance, but he could have paid more personal contribution to get his threshold income down to the 200,000 pounds. And that would have then meant that he wouldn't have had the loss of the annual allowance in this tax year. So moving on to employer pension contributions. This is often a popular way of rewarding employees for doing a good job because pension contributions to a registered scheme can be very tax efficient because there's no national insurance charge for the employer. There's no income tax or national insurance for the employee and they are normally tax deductible from the profits if they're wholly and exclusively incurred for the business. So it's a really, really good win-win situation. The employee obviously can't get their hands on that money until they um, approach their retirement, go above the age of uh, 55 or increasing to 57. Then you're looking at, um, but you're looking at getting that at a very, very, very low, uh, well, no tax for the employee. So there's no national insurance for the employer, but still having the, the saving for the employer's business. But that saving is only given on a paid basis. So those of you involved in corporation tax computations will know that you've got to check to see what the um, cre uh, creditor or any accruals for the um, pension contributions by the employer. You've got to adjust for that so the tax relief is only given on a paid basis. Now many individuals, because of the tax advantages it could be as in the context of some planning, you know, you might have employees who are affected by the high income child benefit charge, uh, which of course has just gone up in the uh, spring budget, the thresholds have just gone up. And you might have someone who's at a higher salary who will lose their personal allowance or other um, tax advantages uh, that might want to salary sacrifice some of their salary in exchange for a higher employer pension contribution. Many businesses will also offer an additional supplement in lieu of the national student savings, but whether they do or whether they don't, it's, it's an opportunity to be there. We're not covering salary sacrifice in this webinar in, in any uh, more detail. Um, I'm just mentioning it there. It's got to be an effective salary sacrifice. And there's lots of guidance and my colleague Justine has done on salary sacrifice uh, over the years. And if you've got any questions, about salary sacrifice, I know that Justine would be very pleased to help and support on in any way that she can. But in, back into the, the pensions aspect, you're going to have to bear in mind if you've got pensions for a controlling director or one of their close relatives, you need to think about what, whether the, the pension contribution that's being made is wholly and exclusively incurred for the business. Now, when it's a third party employee who's got nothing to do with the the directors or their or their close family it's probably a little bit clearer to have the 
what's as to what is the going rate for want of a better way of putting um, it. Um, whereas if you've got, say, someone who is a director and their um, spouse is employed by the company and they want to have an employer pension contribution made, you need to look at the, the, the two HMRC manuals that I've got on the screen. So BIM 46035 and BIM 47105. Look at the issues that you need to think about. Now, I was asked, I've been asked this question many times over the years I was working in practice as to whether or not a client could get a deduction for pension contributions made by the employer on behalf of them or on behalf of their spouse or a close family member. And what you need to look at is the total package that's being made, uh, paid to the director, the, control, the controlling shareholder, close relatives, um, etc. Because, and I always turn the question back to the client on this, because I always used to say, well, the client themselves will know what they would pay someone else who's not a family member, is not connected with the family who owns the business, what would they pay them for doing the work that has been done? So if you've got someone who's on a £15,000 salary and they want to pay them a £50,000 pension contribution, then the question I would ask that client is, well, would you pay somebody who isn't part of the family a total package of £65,000? And if they they say no and their chin hits the ground, well then you know that it's too high in terms of being wholly and exclusively incurred for the business. There's no right or wrong answer because it will vary between business and only those businesses will know what's common in their sector for the contribution that that person is making. But it's, it crops up quite a lot, or it used to crop up when I worked in practice quite a lot, that you'd have family members possibly realising that they've got unused annual allowance, so I could put a pension uh, scheme payment can be made, there's cash in the company to make it, they want to make that, they assume that it's going to be corporation tax deductible, but you just need to take that little pause for a moment and say, well, actually, is this someone, uh, is this, is someone who's got the same, exact same work, uh, would they have this, if they were not related to them, would they get paid the same for that, uh, same total package for that uh, work? It may be that they're paid a, a small salary, and say, for example, the going rate for what they're doing is £30,000. They get a £15,000 salary and a £15,000 pension contribution. And that example might be might be perfectly arguable in terms of HMRC used to ask a question is, is this wholly and exclusively incurred for the purpose of the trade? Now, HMRC will be looking at things like this if they come and do an inquiry, I would suspect. They would look closely at any payments to the controlling shareholders and in their close relatives. So it's just something to bear in mind. Have a conversation with your clients about if they've got any um, particular concerns, because they are the ones that will know what's the growing rate and what's acceptable in their particular line of business. And in any case, regardless of whether it's deductible, you need to think, is there going to be an annual allowance charge? So if that taxpayer has got a uh, they're already paid into a pension scheme, then the employer won't necessarily know what the personal circumstances of the individual receiving the pension payment, what their personal circumstances are, whether the award of a high employer contribution is going to give rise to an annual allowance charge, but it's a little bit less attractive if they, they're not getting access to that pension fund now, if they're going to have to make a report on their tax return and pay over a tax liability on something that they've not actually got. So just something to have a think about in terms of the context of employer pension contributions. And lastly, on employer pension contributions for the higher levels of contributions, there's the spending provisions in sections 197 through to 199A of the Finance Act 2004. This spreading rule applies if the contributions in one year is more than 210% of the contribution in the previous accounting period, unless the increase is below £500,000. So the increase is below £500,000, HMRC happy, all other rules being complied, it being wholly exclusively for the purposes of the business, the timing of the relief will be in year one, the year the pension uh, contribution has been paid, of course. Not when it's been accrued, not when there's an accreditor, when it's actually being paid. 
But if you've got higher levels of um, contribution compared to um, one year to the next, you're looking at it being spread over two years if the excess is between half a million and a million, three years between one million and two million, and four years once the excess goes over two million. You're looking at really, really large pension increases from one year to the next. So there must be something particularly significant increase for it to be over to the excess to be over two million pounds um, that would for it to be spread over the four years but um not we've not got time to go into that in any particular detail but if anyone has any queries about the spreading provisions feel free to get in touch with the ICAS tax help desk and be happy to help with any specific problems that you might be suffering from and with that I'll hand over to you Jimmy Oh, well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, yeah, um, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm always excited to talk about complex tax <laughs> and pensions. And there's a, a wonderful update on uh, what's going on with this, of what's going on with this world. You can see from my slide um, that I'm James Edwards. Uh, James, when I'm in trouble, Jamie, to my friends and family. Um, but yeah, I've got a picture here of stethoscopes. Um, and there's a reason for that. My cloud remedy will typically affect people who work for the NHS, or um, it could be uh, it, MPs actually sometimes it's typically council workers or teachers typically typically senior teachers. Now I'm not going to um, go into too much detail on this because number one I don't want to scare you off and number two um, actually what I'm really trying to do is help you identify when it's an issue. I think this is going to be quite a large issue um, coming over the next weeks and certainly over the next few months. Um, it's really a good opportunity for those of you who have uh, private client tax teams um, to pick up some additional work. I know the added value budgets are always uh, sort of talked about and this, this is this is going to be absolutely huge. Um, there's, there's no getting away from it. Um, so I'm going to go through it very high level and I'll try and uh, not be uh, not get into too much detail and sort of point out things, ways for you to spot when it's an issue. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to basically talk about like what has actually happened. Um, what did we do for the 22-23 tax returns? Um, this is effectively something that's going to go back a number of years. Like I'm, I'm going to talk about how far we're actually going to have to get information back from. But 22-23, a lot of tax returns will be wrong. Um, or, or at the very least, there will be uh, some historic issues. Uh, I'm then going to talk about what is expected of us as tax agents. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the HMRC Disclosure Service. It's a new service that's been created in order to deal with this problem. Um, so, yeah, what has happened? Um, it, this won't affect everyone. Uh, it won't even affect everyone that's got a public service pension scheme, um, but it will probably affect a lot of older people if they've been working. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't use the word older. I think it's just because I'm younger. But if you're in a scheme since about 1995 to about 2008, um, then it will probably affect you if you're uh, sort of older and you've been in this public uh, public sector pension scheme. Um, if what happened was that in 2015 all of the public service pension schemes were changed to be this new new scheme and someone took them to court and in 2021 i think it was um the court of appeal um uh, the the court of appeal basically came out and said right okay age discrimination we've got to go back and, and fix this um so <laughs> effectively going to retrospectively fix um what went into people's pensions um, over uh, over the last seven to eight years and that may have tax consequences the what is happening immediately and by immediately i mean summer 2024 the people who are affected by this are going to be written to by their scheme providers and they are going to be asked to make a choice of how they want it to be treated. I'm not going to go into this, and quite frankly, it's an investment advice question. So if someone starts asking you about it, or potentially you've got a client whose spouse has got a question about this, it might come up 
And you basically have to say, you need to speak to a financial advisor unless you're qualified to give uh, and insured to give investment advice. Um, so, yeah, I've spoken to a few financial advisors about this, of how they would go about dealing with it. Um, and it's the bigger problem, other than the tax problem, definitely. Um, and they said that they'll go through cash flow modeling of what's going to be appropriate. It's, there's no easy answer is effectively that's going to depend on circumstances. Um, but the choice that they make will likely affect their, their tax position and it may retrospectively affect their tax position. And uh, the terrifying thing, um, which was well, terrifying to me anyway, um, it could also affect a, a lifetime allowance charge. So if someone is already retired and they paid um, a lifetime allowance, then this could actually affect that too. Um, I read recently that Labour have come out and said in their election manifesto they're not going to reinstate um, lifetime allowance charges, but we can't seem to quite get rid of them. Um, for a lot of these people who are in this system as well they will have protected their lifetime allowance um so they some people had a larger lifetime allowance than the standard million um and that will have a huge impact on this as well um right okay so in 22 23 pension statements for these people were not sent like so you had the scottish pension uh, public pensions authority was the people who i would typically see they just did not send out the statements telling us what the pension input amounts were um and uh, i'm gonna go into <laughs> into that so what did we do um i first found out about this about a year ago about this time last year when one of my sort of specialist surgeon clients i do personal tax return it's not typically that complex usually would have a pension allowance charge in it um and he said to me uh i didn't receive one this year um so maybe i was below the allowance and therefore i don't have a charge and that was when i first started looking into this and it turns out what happened is when the uh, when this legal um ruling came through it put an awful lot of pressure on all the public service pensions and they just basically couldn't give this information because there was just going to be a whole retrospective calculation so they didn't get them so i very broadly and very confidently said no problem let's submit the 22 23 tax returns without it and when we get the information we'll amend the tax returns to include it i'll put a, a lovely uh, letter or a, a blurb in the white space note and say this will be amended um, when we know the information. Um, fortunately, I did not submit that tax return because <laughs> that is entirely wrong. Uh, I've looked at it and what's going to happen is there's this new disclosure service that we need to use and it's not just going to affect 2223. It will likely go back right the way to the 15, 16 tax year. Now, if you can see on the slide here, I've got a sort of table. They, these, are, these are typically the tables you get from the Scottish Public Pensions Authorities. And I think they're really good. They don't just worry about the one year, they typically go back uh, quite a few years. Um, so you've got here, you've got your PIP start, so that's your pension input period, and then you've got your uh, PIP end. Um, you'll notice, um, uh, Chris didn't go into this, thankfully, uh, you'll notice that in 2015, something weird happened, although we did mention the 8th of July, it was clearly an important day. I think it was uh, a date of a budget announcement, um, and uh, it was the, the period in 1516 when we aligned all of the pension input amounts to the tax year, because historically that wasn't the case. Um, so yeah, you can see that the annual allowance there, that was what it was for, for those years. 15, 16 is a little bit confusing. It's not quite as simple as it was 80,000 for the first couple of months and then 40. But for the purposes of the statements, they do look like that. And then they just tell us the pension input amounts. Um, for these pensions, we don't typically talk about, um, we, do, we don't typically uh, look at what's physically got into the pension. Um, oh, sorry, my fault. I've I've moved it on onto my screen, but not this. Yeah, sorry. This is my completely my fault. I've got it on another screen so that I can I can see it. Sorry, my my fault. I should have uh, pushed this across. So yeah, this is the table that I've been talking about. Um, this is what the tables typically look like on the uh, the SPPAs. Uh, statements and, and presumably the other public pensions authorities as well. You may also get another column there that will tell you what the employment income in that particular employment will be, uh, which I, I think is particularly helpful. Um, I'll talk about that as well um, because that's going to be quite relevant. Um, the yeah, the, the annual allowance they've given you there, you cannot take that 
as as fact um because they will only have the details of employment income they won't have details of other things so um they possibly won't have it and as chris was talking about the the, the threshold income and adjustment uh, adjust adjusted adjusted income then the amounts were much lower in some of these years so if you're a senior surgeon and you're earning 150,000 pounds a year you might think oh i'm nowhere near the the threshold income of 200,000 well unfortunately for some of these earlier years they probably will be affected um and hopefully these have originally been dealt with in the original tax returns um so but that's the problem a lot of this thing a lot of these things will now be wrong um so i'm going to go into the next slide now so what is expected of us as tax agents then? Like if uh, the client comes to us and says, hey, I've got this problem, um, what, how can I deal with it? Um, the first question they're gonna probably ask you if you're the trusted advisor is which choice should I make? And as I said previously, that's an investment advice question. Unfortunately, we're, we're not gonna be able to, um, we're not gonna be able to answer it typically. Um, however, once they've made that decision and the amounts have been recalculated, the tax disclosures to HMRC, if that's applicable, will likely be our responsibility. Certainly, if we're preparing the, the tax returns, I think it would be expected of us to do the historic uh, reporting. Um, the 23-24 tax allowance reporting, this shouldn't really affect this year's tax returns, um, with the exception of the fact that maybe unused allowances might be relevant, but hopefully we will get those statements as normal and we'll be able to prepare the tax returns. Uh, they typically come out around October, in my experience, might be pushed back a little bit. As I said, a lot of these departments that produce these reports are going to be under an awful lot of pressure. So it potentially might take a little while. Um, and like I said there, watch out for the unused allowances becoming available. If you, I don't think you can just assume that um, you're going to have the correct amounts if you don't already have the updated information. Um, so, yeah, that's basically what we're going to have to do is this tax disclosure. Um, and it's it's not going to be fun. <laughs> right. Let's talk about the HMRC disclosure service. I've included two links there, and I've been reminded that the slides are going to be uh, available for you to all to see, so um, uh, hopefully you'll find them. If you typed in HMRC McLeod, then you will get various different uh, links and a lot to do with the actual uh, judgment, the actual uh, court case and things. However, the things that you might be more interested in are check if you're affected by the public service pension, <laughs> pension levity um, and the, the actual dis disclosure service itself, which is calculate your public service pension adjustment. Um, I have clicked on both of them and I've got some screenshots um, to show you what it looks like um, and you can make up your own mind. But the other day, I used this check if you're affected. I clicked through various things saying that I have had a pension, I have had a annual allowance charge in previous years. And this is what comes up. Hopefully, hopefully you can read that. This is all on one page, uh, but I've separ separated onto two slides there. Um, so you are affected by the public service pension remedy. Uh, you can see how flimsy this is um, in the way that, um, you you to, you may be due compensation going back to 15 uh, and April 19. And if you are due compensation, it will be paid directly into um, the pension savers scheme. And then it very unhelpfully says you may be due a refund for annual tax charges, or we say you may owe money for the same period. So that's basically where we are at the moment. We have got no idea whether someone's going to be due a repayment for tax charges or whether um, they're going to be due a refund if they've previously paid some. Um, and that that's why I think a lot of people have kept quiet on this. We really just don't have that much information uh, at this point. Um, <laughs> now, I've included the second half of this um, just to terrify the life out of you. And I'm going to point out some, uh, some practical issues here. Um, so the information you're going to need in order to report this stuff, any self-assessment returns that you've filed for all tax years from 1516 to the year 2122, and probably also 2223. Now, my practice is quite young. I can tell you I do not have that information. And uh, apparently, well, I was asking some of the guys at ICAS here, how far back are we meant to keep records? And it's not as far back as that. So how we're going to get that information 
I'm not entirely too sure, if I'm perfectly honest with you. I've not seen any noise from HMRC of a service where we can request historical tax returns. Um, as I mentioned previously, the public pensions authorities will sometimes give you the employment, uh, the P60 figures, uh, going back that far as part of the uh, updated uh, information. However, in my experience, a lot of senior um, medical people in particular will have other income. Uh, they might have um, court uh, professional witness uh, income that might be through a company, which might be the reason that a lot of uh, accountants are used in the first place. They might have some locum income, they might have a rental property, and these are going to affect your adjusted um, incomes and your threshold incomes we can't simply rely on the employment income on its own. It'd be strange if someone was earning £150,000 and having no bank interest. It, it certainly happens, but it's it, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a red flag in my view. Um, if you don't have um, if they've not been doing tax returns. Um, potentially if they've been earning less than £100,000 a year, then um, you will likely just need to get information. That's the next point. Uh, you can see that you're going to need to get details going back to 2010 for some pension schemes. Um, and the reason for that is going to be checking unused uh, allowances going back three years and, and things like that. So it, it's it's going to be a big big job. And um, I, think it's, I think it's quite worrying. Now, don't get me wrong. Just because your pension input amount numbers have changed does not necessarily mean that you've got a tax charge. Like if if you are below the uh, the annual allowances every year, um, you don't have a lifetime allowance issue, and you even with the changes that that doesn't change, then you likely won't have to make any sort of disclosure. Uh, you you may be due some compensation, but hopefully that will be taken care of through the financial advice side rather than the HMRC disclosure. Again, we just don't know. So there might be a lot of phone calls for people who actually just don't have a problem. Um, and but they're still going to get these letters. And how are you going to be able to tell the difference between the people who've got a problem and the people who don't? Um, I don't have an answer for that. I'm afraid um, it's uh, it's basically going to be you just do, got to do the legwork and work out who's got a problem and who doesn't. Um, it's going to be quite hard to fee for, I imagine, and quote for um, until you really know. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, I did have um, the, the other link, the actual disclosure itself. I was going to go and take screenshots of all these absolutely wonderful pages, all the things you're going to have to do. Uh, but unfortunately, if I click onto the next slide and I checked it again this morning, Typical HMRC. <laughs> Sorry if there are any HMRC people here, but the service is currently not available, and there is no warning that the service is currently not available. Um, so yes, we've got a bit of a problem. However, I do have a. Um, I was doing research for this a few months ago, and I did have access to it. So I have a single screenshot to show you what it looks like, um, and it looks. It looks very, very similar to a lot of let property campaigns and uh, sort of overseas disclosure, the, the digital disclosure service. So it's um, if you've used any of those before, then it's it's very similar. Um, so yeah, you've got type in your information, um, give give us the details of your annual allowance background. There won't be terribly much information you have to um, you have to physically provides but it will just be simply give us a number so there'll be a lot of background work happening and uh, yeah it will be a lot of background work and you will just have to type in the figures and hopefully it all goes through fine now a couple of points on this as as chris mentioned um these are final salaries career average um uh, sort of details so the amounts that the um, that the employee is physically paying and the employer is physically paying will not usually correspond too much to the pension input amount. It's all to do with like, the, the change in the value over the course of the year and the consumer price index at the time. So th this can get quite complex if the client's saying, well, I paid in X. It's like, well, that actually doesn't really matter. It's it's how, how, it's, uh, how it's changed in value. So it's going to be a bit of a problem. Um, so yeah, if I haven't scared you too much about this, then uh, please see this as an opportunity for a, additional work. A lot of people will require Require an awful lot of advice on this. You might even have to build some greater relationships with other professionals like financial advisors and things like this. But if it comes up and someone starts talking about McLeod, don't assume it's going to be easy. It, it, there are 
really horrible things that are going to happen in the background. I'm absolutely convinced that the mainstream media are going to pick up on this when people start to realize how complex it is and, and, the, and the cost of the advice it's going to take to get this right. Um, but yeah, uh, good news for tax advisors if you're, if you're looking for work. But yeah, it's, it's, I think it's going to be quite horrible. And unfortunately, we don't know too much about it uh, at the moment, but we'll see in the coming weeks and uh, yeah i'll pass you back over to to david i think it is that i'm passing you over to now thanks very much james uh yeah that, that, that's uh, absolutely fascinating and as you say it seems to be a, a great opportunity for, for for tax advisors but will be uh, a, a immensely complex um to, to to navigate your your way through with that i think we're going to bring um chris back on uh, as uh, uh, as well because we've got a number of questions um in the uh, in the q a that we want to cover so um chris i'm going to come to to, to you first of all um yeah. the, the first question that we've got is that if you've got a sole uh, shareholder sole director in a limited company um, and they've paid the pension contribution of uh, sixty thousand into uh, the director's pension um but their income was only the basic personal allowance level at 12 570 uh, from a limited company would there be an annual allowance charge at that point then? Well, the, um, at that level of income, they are not going to have their annual allowance reduced. Um, so two things I would say. First is from the annual allowance point of view is think about the, um, think about any unused annual allowance in any case from previous years. So if you were looking at a higher level of pension contribution, it might be that there's still not an annual allowance charge because of the previous three years unused annual allowance. Um, but in general terms, because the because the the starting annual allowance is sixty thousand, then that should be okay. But you need to think about um, the corporation tax deductibility. So is that total package of seventy two thousand five hundred and seventy is that commensurate with what the going rate would be? Now I suspect that before the company could pay that level of contribution, it would have to be doing something right in terms of its success, in terms of its profitability, et cetera. Um, and, but that will vary on a case by case, case, case by case basis. But um, if it was above 60, you would need to look at whether or not there was any other um, brought forward allowance. And of course, there might be that the, the shareholder may have already paid pension contributions already, and that you need to take that into account as well or he or she would need to take that into account when doing their tax return because it would be declared on their tax return. It's not something that the employer needs to declare. Yep. So that's that's great. Thanks very much for that. Um, the next question that we uh, came to was, um, and, and, and James touched on this in terms of the investment advice, um, in terms of the decision making, and I think this is what this question is getting at. But if, if a client wants to know how much they can contribute into a pension to bring their earnings down um, under a hundred thousand, are we able to advise them on that amount? So we're able to uh, advise them on the tax side of that. So we can say if you were to make a pension contribution of X, the tax rules as they currently stand, we get your income down to the £100,000 and thus preserve your personal allowance. What you can't do as an accountant and tax advisor is say particular this particular pension investment is a good investment. So what I have done um, in those scenarios in practice, I've um, determined what the, uh, the benefit, the tax benefit would be of a pension invention, uh, investment of that, and then it's time to hand over to the client's independent, um, independent financial advisor who can then give them the appropriate steer. And I think, I mean, Jimmy, I don't know if you want to chip in here as well. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you agreed with me because that's a major part of my February, March work is to, like, I, I use the income record viewer an awful lot now. I, I so I should have mentioned that. That gives you the, the payroll details if someone has got pay YE income. Um, going back to April 2020, so it might, might, might be 2021 tax year. Um, so I go and check that in February, March, look at the employment stuff, say, right, okay, you're going to earn 105,000. Do you have any bonuses? Right, okay. You, sh you can make a pension contribution and it will completely reinstate if you've got nothing else. But I would never suggest what platform to use, whether that's the correct amount that they should put in. It's very specifically say it's good tax planning 
but you should speak to an IFA whether it's correct or for you. It's it, it does sound like no one wants to spend extra money speaking to a, a financial advisor. I know that, but the, quite quite frankly, it might be the wrong decision, even if it's the best tax decision. So yeah, I, I do that every year for pretty much everyone. So I'm glad you said I'm allowed to. Uh, <laughs> so that's good. Yeah, I think I think it, I mean I, I was running the, the the practice management course that we we, we delivered to new practice um, PC holders uh, yesterday, and one of the areas that we do cover is this sort of thing, you know. So um, investment business um, and regulated activity is 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 an absolute minefield. Um, if at all anyone's unclear as to what they can or can't do, either get in touch with us um, through our, our, our technical help desk um, or, 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 or such like. But, you know, absolutely, you know, it's it's regulated activity, whether you will be covered under um, the designated professional body scheme um, or, 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 or otherwise. And even actually in terms of um, advising somebody to go to an IFA. Uh, sometimes that can be a minefield. Um, you know, we talk about on, on on that course. If simply you know you provide, if you actually contact the IFA and make that introduction that way, that is regulated activity, and you need to be covered for 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 that um, by a DB, DPB license. If you just provide the contact details to your client, that isn't a regulated activity. So the whole. Um, FISMA, uh, Financial Services Market Act, regulated activities is a minefield. If you're at all unclear, do get in touch with us uh, and we'll cover that in a bit more detail. Um, and as I say, that could be a whole webinar in its in its own right, um, looking at regulated Absolutely. activity. Um, just just coming back to, to, to you again for a second, um, for the employer contribution to be tax deductible, um, does the contribution need to be made to an employer scheme or can it be paid into uh, a SIP or a SAS? Um, owned by the director shareholder. Uh, thanks, David. Well, for the purpose of the presentation, to try and keep it as, as straightforward as possible, um, I've only talked about pension schemes, but I have came across clients in the past who have had SIP and SAS schemes, um, and the similar tax rules would apply in terms of so if it's a uh, company paying an employer contribution, then you need to look at the timing of it being based on uh, when it's paid. So the company can only claim relief when those contributions are paid. So yes, um, you can have a, they're probably less common um, than the more traditional pension schemes would be. But yeah, uh, certainly when I was working in practice, SIP and SAS arrangements were becoming more popular, particularly when it came to ownership of commercial property. So it may be that the pension scheme might own the business that the company trades from and then it would pay a rent to the pension scheme and that then gives a little bit of retirement benefit for the shareholders when they eventually retire in due course. It's probably something we could do a, a separate webinar on. Um, it's a whole minefield of things um, uh, that we could possibly explore on there. But in general terms, yeah, you can get pensions tax released for payment to SIPs and SAS. Yeah, that's, that's great. Chris, uh, I'll ask you just one further question and then I'll come to James for the, 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 the final question. Um, question is talking about 25% uh, lump sum uh, calculation um, and when that 25% lump sum cal is calculated, um, what about contributions made later after the initial 25% drawdown? Yeah, that's straining into uh, probably something we need to give some further commentary offline. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry, my, um, I've been keeping my cough at bay for the bulk of this webinar and it's just coming in there. Um, but yeah, so you're looking at when the, if someone's extracting from a pension scheme, so if they're from age 55 at the moment or going up to age 57 from 2028, then when the, the, the rules get a little bit complicated if they've got more than one scheme and how the, the whole thing works. But it's at the time of the, so when, let's say the, if they're extracting their first withdrawal, they can have their 25% um, lump sum out. And if they take more than that out, then it's going to be taxable. Um, but it's maybe something that we can maybe give some more um, detailed commentary and uh, guidance on the slides, uh, along with the slides once these go on, on the ICAST website. It's probably the best way just to give a more fuller answer to that question. 
That's brilliant, Chris. Um, we, we are almost out of time, but uh, James, just one final question to, to, to you that's come in. And again, that's around the 2022-23 uh, tax return um, and the disclosure service. Um, so the question is, if we submit the 22-23 tax return as provisional, pending the, the pension information that you mentioned, um, would you actually suggest these can be submitted now as final with no uh, pension annual allowance disclosed as it will be done via the separate HMRC reporting tool? Yeah, I I, re I responded to it in writing as well, so it's written down there. But but yeah, um, that's that's exactly it. Um, they really do not want you doing amended tax returns. I mean, I, that that makes a lot of sense um, on the basis that doing an amended tax return increases the inquiry window and various other sort of issues. So so yeah, they very specifically want you to use this. Um, ho hopefully hopefully your client, um, if if you're talking about a real world example, doesn't actually have. Um, a, following the, the recalculation but but yeah if they do have one you should be using the disclosure service rather than amending I, i'm sure lots of people will just do the amend because again that was my that was my first thought when i read about this but it's because it can affect so many other years that they want you to specifically say this doesn't affect the other years so that's why brilliant James, thanks very much. And also to you, Chris, uh, as well. Thanks for, for, for joining us, both of you. Um, I mean, it's been really fascinating and um, lots to, to, to ponder and think about, I think. Um, so do please remember that you can, of course, keep up to date with all the latest tax uh, and professional news, including the latest information guides and resources on ICAST.com. Uh, I mentioned earlier on the technical support that's available through the ICAST Technical Help Desk. You can, of course, access that through the Contact Us section of the website. Um, and that also covers, uh, as well as the tax issues, uh, auditing, accounting, uh, practice support, AML and ethics. It would be great. I hope you, you have found today's uh, webinar uh, helpful. It'd be great if you could leave us uh, a rating for today's webinar. There's going to be a poll which will uh, pop up on your screens uh, just now or depending upon uh, your system, it might also appear in the chat box at the top of your screen. Um, and we would really appreciate it if uh, you could just take a minute to give us your rating and your, uh, your, your feedback on that. While you're doing that, um, just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, webinars or events which are coming up uh, in face to face. Um, Tomorrow, indeed, you can join uh, our ICAST Sustainability Business Network uh, to delve into the practicalities of adopting the various new sustainability reporting frame frameworks. Uh, ICAST's Director of Sustainability, Fiona Donnelly, will be joined by experts from two organisations who are really leading the way on sustainability disclosures and where they will discuss the practical tips and the shared learnings from their organisation. And of course, on the 17th of June, if you're in or around Edinburgh, do please come along and pose questions to a cross-party panel of general election candidates at our ICAST hustings, um, which we're hosting in CA House. We have invited election candidates from uh, the major parties to present their arguments on the economy, what's next for the UK and the future of public services, as well as much more. So um, do please come along to, to those. We also have a couple of free to attend um, tax related webinars through our Evolve partner, Kroner I, which may also be of interest. And links to sign up to all of these events are available on icast.com forward slash events. It does only leave me uh, to once again thank Chris and James for their excellent insight and of course you, the audience, for joining us on this webinar today. I do hope it has been helpful to you, um, but that's all for now. So thanks for joining us and until the next time, goodbye.